Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, that's, oops, wait, where's my thing? That's me. Um, and uh, yeah, this incredibly long title um, is uh, all about cleaning up unit tests with, with a little bit of Spock towards the end, but it's mostly about just writing cleaner unit tests. So I do apologize, there is a fair bit of code in here um, necessarily, and I'm gonna try and make it as clear as I possibly can. Um, with lots of animations, which take hours. Um, so hopefully you appreciate those. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there is a lot of code. Um, also, there's a lot of really bad tests. So th this is one to start with. Um, I've taken various examples. Some of these are kind of anonymized slightly. Um, some of them from public repos and things. Um, this is an enormous block of code. Uh, and this is supposedly a single test. Um, don't try and parse too much of it, your head will explode. Um, it's got all sorts of issues with this. Um, there's comments all over it, and the comments are telling us that the code is not readable. Um, we've got a wall of code here. It's, 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 it's a huge block. Um, we're testing too many things. In fact, you can tell that because there's an and in the test name, um, which is a dead giveaway. Um, and we've got failure messages in here because the assertions are so unclear that we kind of need to have these extra strings to tell us what actually failed. And they're kind of adding noise when you actually want to read the test. So, yeah, click is a bit on the blink. Um, so this is the method, or one of the methods is actually testing. Um, or rather, this is almost the method um, as it should be. But bonus points if you spot that there's a problem with this, which I've introduced. If I copied and pasted one of these lines to add a new thing, new field, typical kind of thing I might do, and then forget to change one part of it, it's an easy mistake to make. But it's OK, because we have tests. That's what our tests are for. So we run the tests, and they pass. So. Why? What's going on? And at this point, I think uh, it's important to say, like, th there's, there's bad tests because, you know, they're just unreadable. Um, there's bad tests because, yeah, you can't easily tell why it failed. But if the test doesn't even fail, that test, you'd be better off without it. You'd be better off just deleting that test. It is giving you a false sense of confidence. So at this point, this test is in, in that camp. This is, this is a test that we'd be better off not having. So we're going to see if we can turn it into something that we would actually like to have. Firstly, um, we're going to have a look at this thing. This, this appears to be the thing that we're testing, although the weird thing is it's also being mocked at the same time. So that's kind of strange. Um, this is where this thing gets created. OK. It's uh, initing the mocks here. And it's, uh, it's calling create this mock. What does this do? Um, so, oh, okay, seem to have gone back a slide, sorry. Here we go, right. So this is where this thing gets set up. It's got quite a lot of setup. Um, this again is, is, a, is a sign of something quite wrong here because there is a lot of fakery going on on this thing. Too much, really, for, for a simple mock. Um, and when you end up with this much kind of faking stuff going on, you're probably better off with a fake. But it's even more troubling because in, in this sense, we are actually testing this thing and we're setting up fake thing behavior on it as well, which is, is, is a really strange conflict of interest. Um, and there's an interesting comment right at the top here, which says that it will mock the reading as if it was written correctly. And that is exactly what we've just seen. It said that you could save and then read, and it just passed as if we'd written it correctly when we didn't. Am I going? OK, just a sec. Come on. There we go. Right. So as I said, we're, we're doing two things here. So an obvious step, we've got save and we've got read. If we split those into two separate tests, we are already 100% better off. It's more readable. And it's testing one thing in each test. Although we've got a lot of assertions, we've got a lot of verifications, it's essentially testing one thing in each test. We run them. Great, we have, a, we have a failing test. So there we go, we're done, right? 
Yes, okay, it's, it's, this meets the base level, but we can do a lot more than this. Let's just take a look at this one, just one of these. So we've got a whole thing here where we're checking that the thing will return a success value if this happens. This is kind of separate from the values actually being written. So we can pull it out, we've got another test. This is a separate test. If this one fails, we know that part's broken. If the other one fails, we know that part's broken. We want to know which bit is broken immediately when, when a test fails. And we want a test to fail for one reason. So, okay, now we've got this left. This stuff, okay, it's not too bad. We, we, we can read that pretty easily. We could go a little bit further. We could put in something like this where we can check all of those values in one place and it will read very nicely. Um, and if we need the detail, we can very easily see what that's checking. So that's probably the only extra step we might want to take there. Okay, so clean tests. It's this easy, right? So I've seen this written as a clean test because it's very easy to read, right? But the thing is, I can't see what it's testing. I can't see how it's testing it. I can't see how it's checking its assertions. I, I, I actually can't see it doing anything. There's just three sentences there. I don't know what this does. And this is a real, based on a real example. Um, it's clean. It's maybe a little too clean. Um, it's kind of been bleached. Um, so we take those two methods out and put back basically what they were doing, setting up uh, some test data and, and calling the thing we're actually looking to test. This is very crucial. We want to see this in our test. Um, we take this one, what was inside here? Just a simple assertion. Let's put it back in, we can read this. Uh, this is actually designed to be readable. So this is pretty straightforward, we can understand this. If we wanted to go maybe a little step further, we could, now that it's that simple, we could merge this into one line because technically that's a readable line. Assert that, find messages for cleaning with no criteria, it returns as something empty. That's easy. We can understand this, it's pretty much plain English. Which kind of raises a question why we need a test name that tries to express all of that. Ah, sorry, clicker troubles. And just a little recap for you. There we go. So we don't need that. We don't need a test name that is a paragraph. We can have a very simple little test name that tells us very simply what this is trying to say about the thing we're testing. We don't need all the criteria, we don't need all the conditions and all the things we're trying to check all in a test name, which should be something very readable. And it can be when the body of our test actually expresses this stuff. Okay, so one last example. Um, I look too relieved because it is actually a big example. Um, this. Uh, speaking of long test names, um, I actually, my, my brain fails to parse this. I have to, I have to read this multiple times to try and understand what it's actually trying to, trying to say. Um, but I'll get to that test name in a moment because the, the test body is not easily, it, it's not easy to read, and that's why we've ended up with a test name that's trying to make up for it. So there's a lot of things we can do to this test. I'm gonna start with trying to find what's actually being tested. So this is the thing that we're actually doing that we wanna check the results of. It's sort of buried roughly in the middle. Middle sounds good, that's probably about right. We want to set up some fixtures before it, we want to check something after it. Okay, so that's the crucial bit, and this is basically what we're asserting, we're checking something. Uh, expected jobs was set up okay here, so let's shift that around. And now we've got all our fixtures, and you know, in, in given when then expression, like it's being used in the actual title of the test, and it's far more suited to the body of the test, we can see here's all the fixtures, Here's the thing we're testing. Here's the thing we're checking. It's a little bit clear already. This is a personal preference of mine. I tend to name the thing that I'm testing SUT. It's a common abbreviation system under test. The only reason I do this, um, and this is you know, very much a personal preference thing, 
Um, I find that if I name that one in a unit test SUT, then everything else can just be named very plainly if it's a collaborator. I don't need to try and give it a name like a mock something or a fake something. Everything else that doesn't say SUT must be some sort of collaborator. It must be some sort of double for a test. The thing that's SUT, that's obviously the thing I'm testing in any one of my unit tests. You can immediately spot the thing that you're testing. Some people don't like this, but yeah, it's my preference. My slides, so I get to do this. Um, so what next? Um, well, this is uh, something you might have noticed. It's, uh, it's testing an Rx-based thing. It's a slightly more modern example. Um, and it's quite a common thing. You see the whole test subscriber stuff. This, this subscriber stuff, it's pretty much just adding noise. Um, we don't really, it's not what we care about. We don't care about uh, there being the ability to have a test subscriber and so on, and what scheduler we're subscribing on, but just because we're in a test and we want it to execute immediately, we don't we don't care about any of that. It's for the purpose of our test, it's noise, and if we can get rid of it, then great. So, assert J. Um, assert J is fantastic for this kind of stuff. Um, and there are other systems for doing this. You could use Hamcrest, you could use uh, Fest or something, although. AssertJ is essentially a more modern version of Fest, so I don't know why you would. Um, so basically, we can introduce a class like this, a simple little thing, um, where basically we've got a little static uh, factory method that will give us back this, this assertion object. Um, and, it, and you can see we've basically chucked in the, the scheduling stuff in here and the subscription, so we can keep all of that just out of the tests. Because we're going to, you, whenever you're doing anything with Rx, you're going to want to do this stuff all the time. So why write it in every single test? And why have it polluting every single test with noise? And then we can have these simple little methods on here for checking things like this. Um, so if we use this and put this into our test, we can get rid of that line. Come on. Come on. There we go. We can get rid of that. Uh, we can a little bit simplify this, uh, change this around, so we can say that assert that a subscriber to that observable will have received these things. Um, and we can use that in every single Rx, you know, kind of thing that we're testing. Um, so that's a little bit smaller. All this stuff, this is incredibly noisy. Um, and I find this kind of interesting because whoever wrote this actually took the, the, the consideration that the list for the first one here needs to be a list, but then the second thing only has a single item in the list, so I might as well use singleton list, as if that matters in a test. Um, so this is just adding all sorts of confusion and noise, and especially this wonderful thing with all the generics. Uh, this is absolutely lovely. Um, so we can get rid of all of that. We, we can just introduce simple little methods that just do exactly what they, those things did. So we can put in a method for a list, and all it contains in it is the arrays, you know, the, the new list. If we can put in a thing that will just create us the map entry. It just cleans it up a little bit. End up with something like this. This is a bit more readable. Um, this thing. Now that this is actually kind of simple, um, and, and to be honest, and again, this is somewhat a matter of preference, but I would say this is also very simple. I would take both of these, probably just chuck them inside my assertion, because it's actually still quite a readable kind of thing in a kind of a sentence. Uh, subscriber to this method will receive a list, and the list looks like this. Um, I, there is another whole issue with this method anyway, in the, in the sense that it's returning maps of lists and things, and there's no real strong data typing here, but that's... Not, I'm not going to try changing that for now. This is uh, more about what this test looks like. Um, OK, so that's, that's pretty cool. These me methods at the top, I don't really understand these. Um, given jobs, there's a list. And given jobs, another list. And it's weird because actually what it seems to be doing is it, it's jobs for this user and jobs for this user. But the user, the, the kind of most important thing here is just kind of tacked on the end. So I would just switch that around, um, given jobs for user. And also we'll just put a varugs thing here so we can just put the, we can get rid of a little bit more noise. It's just, you know, there's the jobs for that user, there's the jobs for that user. OK, great. It's a little bit clearer. But one of the major problems I think with this test is I can't really see the sense in what it's testing. 
So although artificially, like superficially, um, we've cleaned it up a lot, but you can't really understand how these fixtures work, um, why, why, why that should be that this, this does this just because I said these things. Um, here I'm using presumably some sort of user object. Here I'm using a username. Does this username correspond to this and this username correspond to this? Possibly, their names are kind of similar, but I, I don't know, I can't really see that it does. If I go look elsewhere in this test class, yeah, I can find a whole bunch of constants at the top where all these users have been defined. I can find stuff in setup where it sets up some, some, some people and it sets up some sort of mapping between usernames. And this is all the stuff that's actually essentially missing from my test. It, it's been removed because someone's trying to remove duplication, but they've also removed the things in the test that kind of show how it works, why it makes sense. So it's kind of... It's a, it's a sentence, you know, or a, a paragraph of text, but you've taken out all of the, all of the words that would link the sentences together. You, you can't understand the context anymore. If we put them back in, we'd end up with something more like this. It's a little bit scrappy, but this is kind of a rough thing of just putting them, that back in without doing too much to it. So we set up some jobs for user one and user two, we will say that if the job service has jobs for user one and user two, and this is, you know, again, a simple little trick, you know, we can just make this static method here where if we pass in this thing, it will return us some other object that we're just going to use for our tests, and we can put methods on it that allow us to, to set up fixtures like this. So it's just a, a nicer, you know, kind of DSL tricks in Java to, to create something that reads nicely. Um, so we can say, okay, the job service has jobs for this user and this user, and then if the username mapping service could map this external username to, the, to this user's name and this one to this user's name, then if I use those names and I query by them, I should get those jobs. And at this point, we can actually kind of understand what it was that this was trying to verify. It might actually be trying to verify too much all at once, but we can read this and we can kind of understand it, we can make sense of it. And the crucial thing is, once we can read this and we can understand it, again, the body of the test says this. The name of the test, this is just, this is way too much. I can't read that. We need a simple name. What does this thing do? It finds jobs for users by external usernames. OK. And if this test fails, then I know that it no longer is able to find jobs for users by external usernames. This is a simple little name. It would make sense immediately if I saw it was failing. So, having gone through all of those, some common test code smells. Um, and I am a contract and freelance kind of guy, so I tend to move around a bit and I see a lot of these kind of things. Um, if you see comments in your tests, and this, in, this does include, uh, there are some testing frameworks I'm not so keen on, that tend to use strings a lot in the descriptions of things, and, and it does tend to have the same effect. When you can write these plain strings for your given bit and then for your when bit, that aren't actually executable code, they're, they're just a description of what the code does, they do the same thing as comments in that they're an excuse for not making the code expressive. It's, it's okay if they're, they're contributing to a report somehow, that's kind of nice, but they mustn't be an excuse for the code itself telling you what it's doing. Comments will get out of sync, and that's no less true for tests. If we get these big, unreadable test names, I can't easily parse that, so you know, it's, it's, it's slowing down the amount of time that's going to take me to kind of figure out what's going on when a test fails. If we see and in a test name, that's, that's got to be one of the worst. Um, you see this a lot. If, the, if you see and in a test name, that's big red flag. Um, you get a huge block of assertions. And this one, actually, I think this is, this is generally you know, acknowledged. If you see a lot of assertions in a test, it's, that's a bad sign. It's probably testing too much. And, and even if it's, if it's not and it's just trying to test lots of uh, facets of the same thing, then maybe it can be expressed in a more clean way. Uh, likewise, if there's custom messages there, they're kind of just going to get in the way of you actually parsing the test when you're trying to make sense of it. 
Um, if you're seeing mocking of things that are not collaborators, um, so mocking the thing you're testing, that's, that's a big problem. Um, and it's probably going to cause you trouble. Also, I've seen people mocking uh, like value objects. Uh, you know, your, your value objects ideally would be, if they are really just tiny little value objects, they'd be immutable. Um, and you can happily create those and use those in a test. You don't need to mock them. And if you do, you're probably going to introduce a lot of pain. Um, and if you see mocks that are returning mocks, because this just tends to be, this is one of those kind of rule of thumb. If you see a mock return a mock, probably your mocks are too complicated at this point. Probably you're doing too much. If you see a lot of overcomplicated setup of scenarios on your mocks, re like lots and lots of when it does this, then it does this, and you see big blocks of this, maybe just write a fake instead a simple fake that's not using any kind of framework, because it's going to be easier to read and understand and reuse. Uh, and finally, and this is one, as I sort of said, you, you see these tests that sometimes they, they read clearly, but you don't really understand how it tests something. And that's usually because, essentially, the connection between the clauses in the test has been lost. So. I guess my main point is, is that test readability is something that I find is, is overlooked. Um, I, I've found you know, plenty of uh, people will write really clean, expressive production code, but there's this kind of um, something about the, the word production that, gives it a, that bestows a certain kind of uh, honor upon that code, that that must be clean. But the test code, that's not what we're shipping. That's fine. That doesn't need to be as good. It, it should be better. Um, the, the tests have to be maintained just the same. And the tests are the spec for that code. So if, even if you couldn't read the production code, you could read the spec and it would tell you what it does. That's what your tests are. So it should be more readable. But it's important when you're trying to get rid of all the noise that you don't actually lose the, the nouns, the, the, the fixtures that you're setting up. So if you're, setting, if you're using test data bits and you're setting up that test data and then you're using it and you're expecting it, you need to be able to see how that, that thread runs through the test. Most importantly, a test really, really does have to fail if the code is broken. And this is kind of a fun game. Um, I used to work with a guy who uh, was quite fond of this game. Um, you compare with somebody, and you know there's a common thing of doing this uh, ping pong kind of pairing where I write a test, you write the implementation, you write a test, I write the implementation. Um, you can also kind of do this, okay, well, once you've written that implementation and we've got tests on it and everything, I'm going to try and find a way to break the implementation. And if the tests don't fail, we've done something wrong. So it's, it, it can be an interesting kind of thought exercise, little, little thing. Um, and you know, if, you, if you're feeling a bit devious and you, you need to get some of that out, uh, it's a great, great way to do so. Uh, pick somebody's code and, and, and see if you can break their, their code, but without breaking their tests. Um, they'll hate you a little bit for it, but they'll, they'll also kind of appreciate it. Um, and when it does fail, the, the messages really need to be clear. Um, so you, know, you need to check those messages. Um, you know, we have this whole red-green refactor um, kind of thing, but it's not just red. It's, okay, red, and, and what does the failure message tell me? Is that a really nice, expressive, clean failure message? If I saw this failing, would I know what the problem was immediately? Can I make it clearer? And I don't mean by putting in, like, big strings um, because it's not giving you a good enough message. Usually, if you use something like a matcher or a cert J or something, it will, it will give you cleaner messages. It will explain why things did not match and you know, what the things were. And probably your test should be that small that it's kind of obvious. So uh, this kind of seamlessly uh, brings me onto Spock. This is a little bit old now, I have to admit, Spock. Um, and it hasn't received so much love lately. but. The reason I'm so keen on it is because essentially I haven't seen anything better yet. Um, and I've tried a few things. Um, but as you can see, it received so much love that it hasn't even got a logo. Um, it's, uh, it's, got, it's got reasonable documentation, but that documentation is on Google code, which indicates it's not exactly being maintained. Um, but this is the kind of thing that you can write in the, in the tests because it's based on Groovy. Um, which sounds horrible and scary, but we're not building Android apps in, in Groovy here. This is just stuff that's going to run on a JVM. 
So what we're really talking about is Java, but with the ability to use a bit of DSL, a little bit of kind of, um, there's some messing with the uh, syntax tree where it can rearrange things. So you can write your tests in a more natural kind of way. Um, it has this kind of given when then thing baked into it. Um, it actually kind of recognizes these as parts of your test. So in, for instance, the, um, in, in the then clause, if you try and put something in there that's trying to do the wrong kind of thing, it will say, well, that's not really what I expected. I expected something that, that evaluates that I can check, and, and that's not what you've put, in, put here. So it keeps you a little true on your kind of structure of a test. But you have the flexibility, you know, you can kind of say when, uh, you don't have to start with a given. You can say, you know, and put where, and you can kind of substitute in values. So this, this allows you to do nice kind of easy mocking and stubbing and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it has very nice syntax for this kind of stuff because it's groovy. So you, you, they've taken advantage of the sort of DSL capabilities. Um, so, for example, um, if you are using Hamcrest, um, it's got, you know, this basic support for it where you can kind of use matches. Um, and as I mentioned, because it's groovy, essentially DSL stuff and metaprogramming. So you can rearrange things in ways that they just read more naturally when really you kind of know that what it's actually doing is kind of, well, yeah, sure, there was some braces here, there was a dot here, whatever. But that's not important. Um, so it gives you, it just gets rid of a tiny little bit more of that noise. Um, also things like this, you can put extension methods onto things, which obviously, uh, especially with things like Kotlin now, is becoming very popular you, uh, and very, very useful for testing. Uh, also a good reason why Kotlin is actually very nice for writing tests. Um, see if I can, there we go. It's also got stuff like this, and this is something which, um, as yet, I haven't found a way to do this kind of crazy stuff in Kotlin, and, this, uh, and, I, and I like I, what I've seen so far, I like tests written in Kotlin, but um, this kind of stuff, uh, it comes from uh, Groovy's ability to manipulate the, the syntax tree um, within the language. So uh, it also makes it kind of hard for IDEs and things to, to deal with it um, historically, but it allows it to do crazy stuff like this old thing. So I can say, okay, I want you to do this method, and then I want you to verify that this value is equal to the old value of this value. As in, before I just did that, so you, you, wait, you need to go back and you need to remember that because I'm then gonna verify this later. But I can write it in a way that is how I would say this it, it, without kind of saying, well, I need to store the value. Then I need to do this. Magic. Um, <laughs> And this, I, this is one thing I absolutely love about this. So the, the failure messages uh, on this thing are so detailed. Um, it will give you the expression that didn't actually, you know, the, the failed uh, the verification. And it'll break down every t last little bit of the thing. So I'll tell you, oh, this is this object, uh, this value was this, uh, this is false, it did not equal, and there were nine differences. And if you really care, it was a 62% similarity, which is quite, uh, I don't know, that's uh, going a bit above and beyond. But uh, it's, this, this fantastic breakdown means that the moment you get a, a failure, you, you generally know exactly what happened, um, which is invaluable. So it's got spying. Um, so for instance, you know, I'm, I'm verifying that this thing must have been called once. It's got stubbing. I, I can say, well, if somebody calls this, return the number four. Um, it's got wild cards um, with a kind of a nice natural way of doing it. So you know, you've got these underscores for wild cards. Um, it's got ranges of things. So I could say, well, this thing was called at least one time, but up to, who cares? Or it has to be called, it, it, it was called at most two times, or it's pretty flexible. It's nice syntax for this. It's also got some really crazy stuff. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using this, but you can actually use regexes. Um, that's, I mean, I guess this kind of could be useful. You could say no methods looking like this were called, but it's not terribly easy to parse, so maybe, maybe not. But it's there. Um, it's got 
all sorts of stuff for, for faking, if you need to set up fakes and things. Um, again, you know, if, you, if you're going to be using a fake a lot, probably just create a proper fake anyway. But if you know, you're just using it once or twice and it's a little bit, well, then you can do all sorts of interesting stuff here. I could say, uh, uh, let's see, what have I got here? So for instance, when you call this thing, uh, you're going to call it with a parameter. I'm going to capture that parameter, and then I'm going to have a look at it and check that you know this thing. If if it was above three, then I'm going to return this. Otherwise, I'm going to return this. This stuff, you know, normally in Java, obviously you end up with things like uh, Mojito, for instance, and you'd have an argument captor, and there's all sorts of noise that really isn't anything to do with what you're actually trying to do. Um, so, and in this case, you know, I can just say, well, when you call this, it'll throw this. Uh, I could even say, when you call this, the first three times, okay, you're going to get this, this, and then this. Then the fourth time, it's going to throw an exception. Then the fifth time, it's going to return this. It's like, and, and it's so succinct to say these things. And again, this, this largely just comes from having, having a language that allows you to use this kind of DSL. But also the fact that they have built in the mocking. Um, this is one of my favorite things. You've got data-driven tests. So I don't know if anyone's ever written data-driven tests in JUnit, but frankly, you're kind of better off not doing so, um, I would say. They're very, very unreadable. Um, in fact, I would generally always prefer to maybe you know, write, a, write a bunch of tests that just call another method with parameters. That would be much clearer in JUnit than writing a parameterized test, because they're ugly. Um, this one, on the other hand, I can write a data table into my test. I can also put these little, nice little kind of hash things in here in the name. And, and because I've said unroll, this is basically going to run, run this test for every single one of these, these uh, rows in the, in the table. Um, and it will show each one as a separate test. And, and as you can see, it actually gives it the name with these tokens substituted. So if that fails in that specific case, I can see that it failed in that specific case. And again, there's this whole breakdown thing again. So I can see everything that was involved, how it, you know, why it doesn't match. So basically, uh, it's Groovy based, as I said, um, which, yeah, sure, I'm not recommending you go write your Android apps in Groovy. You can, but it, it, I think that's a lot of pain. But for writing things on the JVM, uh, different rules apply. And in this case, you're pretty much writing Java, but you've just got some of the capabilities that uh, DSL, the, the DSL and the metaprogramming kind of stuff that, that is added in. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, expressive DSL abilities. Um, you've got magic, um, which is great. Um, the one downside I would say to this, uh, because it's groovy, uh, it's groovy based, most of the time the, the syntax highlighting and all the rest of it is fine, but just occasionally you know, your autocomplete or something will say, well, I don't know, you could want anything because this is groovy, you could probably pull in anything at this point. So sometimes your IDE won't, you know, the autocompletion or, or highlighting will just be a little off. Honestly, it's, that is majorly inconvenient, it's, it's the worst thing about it. But I would consider that compared to all the things it gives you. For me, this is an acceptable trade-off. I still, for all the things I can do in this and for the expressive tests I can write in this, I'm happy to, to, to deal with that. Um, it has this kind of built-in, very expressive mocking, which is better than any other kind of mocking framework I've seen in Java. Um, and I've used a good few of those. Um, it, because you're in Groovy, again, you've, you've just got this ability to, to write the, the mocking kind of setup and verification and so on in a way that you just can't do in Java. Um, and you've got these data-driven tests, these unrolling, wonderful, magic uh, data-driven tests, which, uh, yeah, I absolutely love. So I think that's about it. Yep, great. That is the slides, assuming they uploaded. I was uploading them the minute before I stood up here, so hopefully they're out there. <laughs> Um, and uh, any questions? Yeah, um, Spock and Espresso, yes. Um, is, is it possible? Um, so there have been a couple of things that kind of looked at doing this, uh, like people's you know, GitHub repos and stuff I've seen. Um, the most promising one, uh, last, I, last I used it, it was functional. Um, well, yeah, not functional, programming functional. It was, it was working. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it works. Um, I say, 
There's a lot of syntactic sugar you can put around Espresso that actually makes it read more naturally anyway in Java. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't come with that, but, um, but yes, uh, you can use this stuff uh, with that as well, but obviously, when you consider a lot of the things you'll be verifying in, in uh, Espresso, you would be verifying those using Espresso's kind of methods for you know, looking through the view hierarchy and so on. So you, the amount it gains you is, is less. But yeah, there, there is a project that does this. Um, I think there was one that tried to do it with RoboElectric or something, which was a bit crazy. Uh, and then there was actually one that tried to do it with Espresso properly. Um, and it did work, but yeah, I, I don't really use it myself. I mostly use it for unit tests. Okay, well, um, if anyone wants to talk about unit testing, testing in general, uh, reverse engineering, whatever, just find me, grab me, talk to me. Um, and yeah, thanks very much.